everyone, and welcome to What Scares Us, a podcast where four friends share the movies that freak us out. What Scares Us is brought to you by the Ann Arbor District Library. Like I said, we are four friends and co-workers who used to chase each other down in the AADL halls to chat about horror. So we decided to make a podcast and share our findings with the listening audience. We invite you to join us as each episode, one of us selects a spooky movie to discuss with the group. I chose the movie for this episode, and it's one of my favorites. In fact, I originally came across it while browsing the shelves at the Pittsfield branch of the AADL around 15 years ago. So, let's get started. Since this is our first episode, we are going to spend a little bit of time introducing ourselves. I'll go first. My name is Christopher, and I do love horror movies for lots of reasons. I think they give a really interesting commentary on society. Also, they're scary, and that's a lot of fun. I'm Matt, and uh, I also love horror movies for the same reasons that Christopher said, but... um, Copy. <laughs> yeah, I'm I I'm a shame shameless copier. Uh, no, I I some of the first movies that I ever saw were horror movies, probably at inappropriate ages. So I was corrupted early, and my threshold is super high for really weird and fucked up <laughs> shit. So I uh, so yeah, the, the horror is kind of one of my favorite genres, but I also just love watching movies in general. So. I'm Amanda. I watch a lot of movies and television. Horror is not my favorite genre, but I feel like, and I also don't like categorizing films in that way. Um, but as somebody who grew up in the 80s watching all the slasher films, like at a very, very, you know, nine to 10 year old slumber party age, when I grew up, I had, I would define those slasher movies I was watching at the age of 10 that I didn't really like to what horror movies were. So it took me a while to realize, hey, you could actually enjoy a quote unquote horror film and it doesn't have to be this specifically, you know, Hellraiser movie you tried to watch when you were nine, that kind of thing. So I had a little bit of trouble with the genre, but there are some really, really, really great, amazing like horror movies, whether they're like from the 80s or some of these highbrow like modern ones. So I'm, um, and I've watched a lot over the past couple of years, more or so since I've had a lot of extra time on my hands um, <laughs> being in my home. So I'm really excited to come together and just like chat about horror movies, like actually for the world to hear instead of just us in the hallway. So I'm excited. Yeah. I'm so surprised to hear you say that you're not a, like you, wouldn't choose horror as your favorite genre because you're like Stephen King, Qu- Stephen King Queen. <laughs> I but think that's a thing. <laughs> I, think, I think you and I can share that title, Allison. Um, <laughs> but I, yeah, I, for me, I think it's the genre thing, and I think just watching some some slasher films I did not like when I was a child, and so growing up, and I don't know what age I define like growing up. I just to me, if you said horror movies, it was just like Freddy Krueger yeah. and Friday the Thirteenth, and those. That was what horror the quote unquote the genre of horror was. And I didn't I I don't wanna like even now, like I'll watch Friday the thirteenth. I don't wanna watch all the Freddy Krueger movies. Like I just that's not what I I wanna watch some of the weirder, freakier stuff or the newer, like really smart, intelligent, or the movie like we're discussing today, like things you gotta think about. Yep. Um but I do love some good eighty slashers and I'm sure that'll come up over time as we continue our conversation. Oh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Um but yeah, I do but again, I don't. I also don't have an aversion to like blood and gore. I feel like I'm kind of desensitized for whatever reason. Um, <laughs> so I have no idea what Stephen King has to do with that, but it'll it'll come in line somewhere. <sighs> oh yeah. <laughs> I'm Allison. I love horror. Um, most of what I've seen is like a weird thing to say, but post 9/11, just because of my age. Interesting. Um, yeah, I was thinking about it, like preparing for this. Um, I feel like I've seen most horror sort of outside of time. Like, I saw Cabin in the Woods before I saw Evil Dead, that sort of thing. Weird. So, yeah, just something I've been thinking about a lot is I feel like I've seen everything sort of backwards and seen what was inspired by these, mm-hmm. like, very classic movies first. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going back now to see um, sort of older stuff. Um, I'm really into, like... 60s horror which is weird like i love william castle and all those gimmicks um i like psycho and the birds that sort of thing but i would say that most of the horror that i watch is more recent Mm. i also really love asian horror which brings us to our movie for today which is a tale of two sisters which is a 2003 south korean horror movie directed by kim ji woon one thing I really love about this movie is there's such good rewatch value. Watching it again, um, 
you'll notice that every little tiny thing is meaningful. Lines mm -hmm. that didn't make sense before have like an extra meaning once you understand what's happening and you've seen that last scene. Well, one thing too about this film is that it's very quiet. There's a lot yeah. of quietness and it's the quiet kind of movie where you still have to watch the screen to to see what's happening because because with the emotions on their faces and where they are and the cinematography, whoa, but mm -hmm. every shot was just beautiful and you wanted to see that detail. And then it's like, oh wait, there's there's finally a subtitle. And then as they the small seasons where there weren't more than one person on film, you got to see the the, the subtitles. I will admit I have not seen um, a lot of the cool, awesome, amazing Korean horror movies that are out there. I have Same. a couple that have been on my list that I really want to watch. I really want to watch Train to Busan and The Host. And I wanted to watch them before we talked today, but life and time. Yeah. Um, so, but I do like this movie, but since it was so sparse and quiet, I also, I don't gravitate towards, I have a hard time selecting which movies I want to watch with subtitles. Mm -hmm. And for a movie where it's, for me, the reason is because I love, I like filmmaking and film and visuals. The visual and the cinematography is like one of my favorite things in film. And for me, I want to see everything on screen and not have to avert my eyes to the bottom to read the subtitle. So for me, that's just a personal struggle, mm -hmm. not just horror or in any language, but I, I'm very selective when I do watch subtitles. So for this one and some of the other horror ones, I'll put them on my list and go to check them out. Then I'll check them out from the library or try to stream them. And I'm just not in the mood for that subtitle. For, so for this, I was sort of, I had a deadline and mm -hmm. a self-imposed or Allison imposed deadline, <laughs> um, a show <laughs> podcast studio booking date. So I was forced to watch it. And again, once you're in it, you're fine. It's just getting to that moment of crossing that threshold. There's another movie, um, Ray Exports. Have you guys seen that one? It's a Finnish mm -hmm. film. Mm -mm. It's a holiday horror. It is so good. It came out a million years ago, like 2010 or 11. I had it on my list. I had it checked out and I didn't watch it for 10 years. I finally watched it last year. I love it. It's one of my favorite holiday movies, one of my favorite horror movies, Rare wow. Exports. Highly huh. recommend it. Um, it has a young boy as the protagonist, mm -hmm. and I love little boy adventure stories where the kids are off on adventures, and, but it's also bloody and gory and it involves Santa. So, <laughs> but anyways, that was one of the more recent movies that I'd watched with subtitles or horror-related movies with subtitles that I didn't watch and enjoyed. And so, subtitles on screen, I don't want to read them, but for this one, there's so much beautiful cinematography. I wanted to see right. their faces and all of the shots and the sweeping pans, and there were some really good ones in here. Oh, absolutely. But luckily... Since it was more on the quiet side, I got to still see a lot of that. Or I would read the stuff and go back and forth and rewind to see. Yep. So I'm just a bit of a snob with cinematography. <laughs> That's okay. That's a good thing. <laughs> um, Christopher and Matt, do you have any experience with Korean horror? I have seen a few movies. So I loved the host so much. First of all, it opens with the old American doctor, who is one of my favorite characters in the uh, in the Heat of the Night. He's in that movie. He's great. Um, of course, most people know him from The Walking Dead. Oh. But the movie is I love it. It mixes comedy and horror, which is so un-American, and I love it. And uh, it's so nice to see movies from another country where you get to see genres mixed up like that, that mm -hmm. we don't, that the U.S. doesn't normally do. I, you know, I, I know I saw The Host years and years ago, probably right around when it actually came out. And I remember enjoying it. I don't remember a lot of the details of it. Um, and really my experience with specifically like Korean horror films is pretty limited. This was uncharted territory for me. And like kind of a general note that I had about the movie, like you were saying, Amanda, it, it was very quiet. And something that, like, American horror films has taught me is that, like, I was weirdly on edge for the first 20 minutes of the movie, like, waiting, like, oh, something fucked up's about to happen, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, or, like, they're going to, they're going to, like, pack in a jump scare or something here. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a little bit, it was, it was unnerving, actually. Like, it was, and that was probably by design. I'm mm -hmm. sure that that was by design. Yeah. Um, like, they, they show, they point you to so many different things that you're like, something's going to pop out of that. But it didn't mm -hmm. really start doing that until much later in the movie, mm -hmm. which I thought was pretty neat. But, yeah, to answer your question, no, this I don't really have that much experience with Korean <laughs> horror movies. Yeah. One thing that Christopher said that I think is interesting is the mixing of genres. That's actually a pretty common element of Korean films mm -hmm. in general, not just horror movies, but I think that Korean cinema is much more 
um, willing to mix genres. And I think it really works, especially for something like horror. It mm-hmm. almost takes you off edge. Like mm-hmm. you watch something spooky or something that has a lot of tension. But then if you're shown something a little more lighthearted, you sort of ease up and you sort of, um, you know, you let your guard down. But then it'll come and just wallop you again with something very yeah. fucked up. But it's like this back and forth um, that I think is really interesting and cool. I think that I was thinking of some of the other Korean films I've seen leading up to this. And Parasite was one of those. It's not specifically horror, but it totally was a dark comedy. Like there were some mm-hmm. gruesome things happening, but it had these moments of humor and funny and silliness. So I really, and when I watch horror or something that's really dark, I do like those moments of comedy. Like I'm looking for those jokes. I want those funny one-liners. It does lighten the moment. It's still scary and spooky. You're still waiting for that thing to jump out or like the blood just starts squirting everywhere. Right. But I like those funny bits. And when I was younger and things, like when I watched Pulp Fiction in the movie theater for the first time, I was just laughing hysterically in a friend of mine who is not so much into like blood and gore. And I'm like, it never, you know, phased me all of the blood and guts and whatever. Like, I, it was just hilarious to me. Like she made me feel like I was like a psycho. Oh, right. <laughs> I internalized her opinion of me, not her saying that to me. I just thought, why am I, people are getting murdered and there's blood everywhere, but it's hilarious. And <laughs> oh, it's, it's a, and to your point, like I have the exact same reaction when I see something crazy violent happen because it's so, I think because it's so, um, far outside of what I would, what, like, what would really happen. You know, it's something like Pulp Fiction or even um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Like, the way that that movie ends, I was dying laughing in the theater yeah. at that because I, and it's horrible. So we get shot with a fucking flamethrower. But I'm <laughs> I'm laughing. And also, like, in something like Midsummer, when mm-hmm. really terrible stuff is happening, my knee-jerk reaction is, like, I'm laughing. Or I like it when I'm in a theater and there's people there. And if it is something dark, when something potentially funny that I assume is funny and I laugh and there's a few other people that are cackling too. I'm like, yes, Mm -hmm. because we got the thing that we were supposed to get or should have gotten. And other people are like, oh my goodness, those people, this is not, this is sad. They're being murdered. Um, There was not a second of that in this movie. No, (laughs) There was not. No, no. A couple sort of fun facts. A Tale of Two Sisters is inspired by a really famous Korean folktale called Rose Flower Red Lotus. It's hugely popular. It's sort of like an equivalent to Little Red Riding Hood or Cinderella, where it's just really entrenched in the culture of Korea. Mm. Um, And it's been adapted like five or six times. The first movie adaptation was made in 1924. So it's like this really long spanning folktale. Um, This movie was seen as an attempt to aesthetically elevate the horror genre and replace the raw aesthetics of low-budget horror cinema with a meticulous use of mise-en-scene. And mise-en-scene in film is like um, everything that's in the frame, the background, the sets, what the characters are wearing, how they're placed in relation to each other. It's everything visual in the shot. Um, And this movie has very particular mise-en-scene. Um, when A Tale of Two Sisters was originally released, it became both the highest grossing South Korean horror film of all time. I believe it still is. I don't think that anything has surpassed it. Um, and it was also the first Korean horror film to be screened in American theaters. It wasn't very many theaters, but it was the first one to sort of break that barrier. So number 21 in Rolling Stone's 65 Greatest Horror Movies of the 21st Century, and it is listed in 101 Horror Movies You Must See Before You Die. And my favorite little fun fact is when Jordan Peele was making the movie Us, he gave Lupita Nyong'o a list of 10 movies so that they would have like a shared language between them, and A Tale of Two Sisters was one of those 10. Nice. And I love the movie Us. It's one of my favorites. I should add that we're starting to get into spoiler territory here. Mm. And if you're going to watch this film, you really should do so without knowing very (laughs) much about it. So hit pause on this podcast, check out A Tale of Two Sisters, and then join us again once you've seen it. So it has been so long since I've seen this with fresh eyes. It's been literally 15 years and I've seen it a thousand times. I'm really wondering what a first viewing of this movie is like. Stressful. 
um, <laughs> in a way that I didn't anticipate because I wasn't, you know, at least for me, I spent the f- first hour of the movie frantically trying to guess what was going to happen. I have these beat by beat notes that as I'm looking at them are insane because <laughs> I was just like, is this person dead? Is this person dead? Yeah. Uh, so it was stressful and um, at no point, like I'm usually pretty good at guessing what is going to happen in a horror movie. Uh, I, at no point was I right. And actually there were a few things that when the movie was over, when I looked it up, I totally missed. Well, I was, my very first note is, 55 minutes in and nothing scary has happened. <laughs> I will just start off by saying I did not find the movie very scary at all. It was more suspenseful or more I was doing what Matt was doing, trying to figure out what was going to get. I was texting Christopher. I was like, what's going on? <laughs> um, but I just found the beginning slow and boring to get into, but it was very visually stimulating and beautiful. I was also waiting for things to jump out of the, the cupboards. I was waiting for more for the jump scares. Yeah. But then once I got to the point of being far into it, and I'm like, okay, there are no jump scares. Or very, there's a couple that pop up later, literally, but that's not the suspense. It's more of just the quiet and the waiting. And I didn't really try to figure out who was dead, who was alive. Like in my, like I figured out the sixth sense. Like I wasn't even watching. I just walked across the room when it was on and I just literally said what it was. And my dad's like, how'd you know that? And I was like, I just, you can tell. I wasn't in the mood to watch this yesterday and I was just feeling grumpy and, but it was beautiful and I wanted to be into it. I wanted to put on like my beautiful, you know, cinematic, like thinking cap and be all super into it and analyze it. And I just wasn't in the mood for that yesterday. And so I watched the film. I was waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And I mean, I finished it at like 1030 last night and mm-hmm. I was trying to gather some notes, but then I was like, I really want to watch it again because there are so many small little pieces that I feel like if you watch it six times or a thousand times like Allison has, you're going to get those little pieces. And I yep. wanted I wanted those. And I wanted those pieces in my brain before we talked about it today. So I feel sad that I didn't or wasn't able to have more time in my life to do all of the things. But I did watch rewatch the last 20 minutes. After I watched the whole thing, I read some articles online, gathered my brain and kind of fizzling through my, okay, stuff happened and this and that. And like, I apologize to the movie and Allison. Um, <laughs> but then I rewatched the last 20 minutes because a lot goes down. And we can talk about that later, but yeah. a lot goes down. So that was my first <clears throat> initial one was like 55 minutes in, nothing serious happened. And I was just kind of like, where's Allison? That was scary. Well, I don't want to be scared. Um, so yeah, Christopher, what were we going to say? So my first note on, uh, as I was watching the movie says, wash basin. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way that that hand washing would fly in COVID times. Like no. that was, was lazy ass <laughs> hand washing. <laughs> that was just that was when I was like, I'm getting too granular with my notes. I probably shouldn't pay attention to this stuff so much, but it's just true. I didn't see any soap, but <laughs> there was a lot of hand stuff. I have like 20 instances of shots of hands in this movie, and I think that the hand washing in the beginning is purely. Thematic. I think it is like washing your hands of responsibility. Mm. And I think that's why they start the movie with that is to sort of give you a peek into what the rest of it makes going sense. To be. There, I watched the bonus content. I did watch the interview with the director. Which one? The one where he talks about feet. Um, the one where you talk. No, you mentioned like how every shot, every single shot in this film was super intentional. Every single shot, um, which I adore in a filmmaker. I love that. And so the the talking about the hands, with they're having the specific specificity. The feet had that too, like the barefoot children versus the the socked adults. So it totally makes sense with the hands. And I didn't read anything about the hands. Yeah. Yeah. So it all ties together. Yeah. And when that, when that was happening, I was just like, oh, okay. So this is, this whole movie is going to be told in the context of like a flashback or something based on that, the way that they were talking to her, like you should remember all this. And, um, so that immediately set me, set me on maybe the wrong foot because I was just like, this is all a flashback, (laughs) you know? But again, that's, that's my own personal viewing mistake. So. I didn't think it was a flashback. I thought that that was something bad had happened and she was in the hospital. So I guess I thought it or viewed it in real time. Um, I thought she was in the hospital Mm -hmm. and then she left the hospital. Then everything that happened in the house happened after she left the hospital. But like in retrospect, some of the questions that he was asking, she wasn't answering any of his questions, but one of the questions was like, who are you now? Or do you know who you are? Mm -hmm. And if you would have just picked up on that at the very first sentence, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
But one of them was like, do you know who you are? Who are you now or something? And right. I, so I only knew that because I read an article afterwards that mentioned that. And I was right. like, oh, crap, yeah. I totally missed that. I did. Uh, everyone did. Yeah. And, I, and that's what I mean. Like, I thought th- that line of questioning made it seem like we're about to be replayed why she's there. You know, that was right. that was at least the way that I interpreted it. Yep. And again, that could just be I missed a little line of dialogue or something, but that I I immediately approached it thinking like, oh okay, we're about to get a play by play of whatever happened that made them look like they do on the cover. Mm-hmm. I love that opening score. Yeah. It's very dramatic. It comes back Ooh. a couple of times mm-hmm. for a movie that otherwise doesn't have a ton of scoring, which is always an interesting choice. Um it definitely I think that helped the movie be a little more tense. But I, but the first thing I said is I loved the opening score. It just was really dramatic. I almost sent you, there's a YouTube video about that melody. Yeah. Um, and I guess, I don't know enough about music to really talk about this, but at some points it sort of um, turns into a minor key or something. Like there's oh, yeah. a little bit of change in it. Yeah. I almost sent it to you, but then I was like, "Is this like sending him like homework?" No, 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 time? no, because it, it's uh, no. I totally hear what you're talking about, and that's what I mean. It's dramatic and it's very effective because it's beautiful. But then there's these haunting little key changes that happen in it, and I was thrilled, honestly, anytime they would play it again, just because it's it's beautiful. Yeah, that melody that is played. I think it's a guitar. Uh-huh. It Maybe. is, which is pretty unusual for for scoring in a movie. I, I made a note of that where I was like, oh, a guitar is the featured <laughs> instrument. But that, but of course I like that because yeah. I like guitar. Yeah, it's so haunting. Yeah. So, and it's also such an odd piece of music. It, to me, I, I thought it sounded just like a 1970s Soviet movie. Really? Yes. Huh. It sounded so out of place, but gorgeous and wonderful and so haunting. Yeah. Why did she eat that flower? So um, I guess that's actually a very common thing in Korea that that the flower on that bush is edible. It relates to the director's childhood. I guess he used to eat them all the time at his house. Well, but it's also red. Right. Well, my brain was like, why the hell did she eat that? Is she going to get sick? Did she transfer it to her sister when they just held hands? Like, I immediately started thinking, like, oh, okay, the, the tragedy is she ate that flower. That flower is going to be the thing that killed both of them or something. Whoa. You know, because that's, the, again, I was trying desperately, and it was probably not a great idea, to solve this movie <laughs> within the first five minutes of it. Well, I was thinking of the color red and, like, red meaning death, and I thought something... Like, oh, this is some sort of, like, Mm -hmm. precursor to some red death. Yeah. I was also sure that something was going to happen in the lake because of the way that the camera is showing you. Like, I was like, oh, okay. Now I know. They're going to eat flowers and drown. (laughs) And that's the movie. I've got this figured out. That shot above the lake with the aerial was so gorgeous. It was. Absolutely. And And after the intro of the girls arriving in the car and that lake scene, I was like, okay, you got to watch everything on the screen because it's beautiful. I love that. And it then was, they brought it back at the end. Yes, it was gorgeous and kind of really off kilter too. Yeah. Like you were waiting right. for something to happen. Right. And it, anyway. Yeah. And Jason Voorhees reaches off for the exactly. water yes. and grabs yeah. one of them's ankle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask though, twice we've said that, uh, <laughs> that everything in the movie has meaning. Okay. What is the meaning behind taking a clock that's not working and starting at 1245 and advancing it to 235. So um, in one of the director commentaries, uh, Kim Ji-woon actually goes into that and he says that he wanted to show the shadow of death and the force of death and that in a lot of ways, Sumi wants to stop time and relive the past oh. events because she's like so wanting things to be the way that they were. Mm. And another thing that he mentions is 1245 may have been the time of death for the mom and for mm-hmm. Suyan. And so it's just sort of showing like she's coming back to this place where time mm-hmm. has stopped for her in her mind. Right. Yeah. Okay. Nice. That, that makes, makes a lot sense. of sense. Yeah. yeah. So I also thought it was interesting how they were playing with the false premise of jump scares. You know, of course, there's the opening of the medicine cabinet and then nothing happens. But it still felt different from a U.S. movie that also plays with false jump scares. It seemed 
it, it was almost like the director was uh, was reassuring you that there would not be those. It's like it was a quick signal to the viewer saying, I'm opening the medicine cabinet, there's a mirror, and I'm closing it. Now you can know how the pace of this movie is coming. As opposed to U.S. movies with mm -hmm. false jump scares. They do it five times, and then they hit you with the real jump scare right after that, right. you know? And so I really appreciated that, too. I th thought the movie was gorgeous and haunting. Um, it was just a little bit slow for me. But... and. We have to all four of us talk about the ending, mm -hmm. and it was kind of complicated. It was interesting. Yeah, it like really builds at the end. Right. Well, I too think that like the ghost was realized as part of that was her psychosis of like the schizophrenic dual personality of like coping with the death of her mother and sister and what her stepmother did and then her leaving and not just walking out of not knowing that moment was happening in the moment. So. Uh, the thing about the ghosts, it's sort of like a coping mechanism of how her mental state of how she's handling it or not handling it was the creation of all of this this world around her, which I thought was fascinating. And who said, Allison, you said this movie, you said you liked sad Korean or sad Asian mm -hmm. horror, but this was not a sad Asian horror. It was so sad. It was very depressing and very sad because you, even before you knew that the sister was dead or what happened it's still very sad because you you know you knew at the beginning she was it's it's in a hospital or what you think is the beginning where i thought it was the beginning where something has happened where she's in the hospital and then there's the photographs and you're like okay there's more hospitals and people and who's is that the mom's nurse or is that her nurse like i was still trying to find and i've only watched it once i was trying to put those pieces together <sighs> yep. you know what i mean um but it, for me it was very sad not just because it was quiet but you just knew it was for me, it was darker and sadder than scary. Yes, definitely. For, for me and my one view of it. Yeah, I think it might have been scarier to find out that the ghost had been there all along because don't we, don't we really find out that there's an actual ghost in the house kind of towards the end of the mm -hmm, movie? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and which is amazing. Right. <laughs> but I think the movie might have been scarier to find uh, that out a little earlier on. Um, so plot-wise, I think finding it out late is fascinating and really, really interesting. But I might have been more scared to know that there's a presence in the house earlier on. And also, I have to give uh, my wife credit for making that astute point. <laughs> that was not something I came up with, but I totally agreed with it after she said that. Yeah. Did she watch it with you? <laughs> no, I just told her about it, and she's like, well, you know. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, she didn't watch it, so... Well, I, I, I kind of have an opposite idea. It's sort of a great way to end it because it ends and you're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> because it just gave it, I think it definitely added something that we didn't find out there was actually in a ghost till the end. And then that horrible woman got her comeuppance. Um, I like that we didn't know till the end because then it would have been more of a, a focus on like, you. there would have been too much going on if you had this ghost in the house, but then it's like, the sister. But if it's the sister, is it somebody she created? Mm -hmm. Is it who sees the ghost and... Yep. I don't know. I mean, I think both. I think you're. It can go any way. But for me, I love. I had a, it was very satisfying to have that. The, the thing at the end happen, and you don't even see right. anything. It's just like under the bed, and I was like, yes, <laughs> right. Because that thing could have jump scared the whole movie, and would have been a completely I, different right. movie if whatever that thing was. Right. Right. It could have been a much lamer movie. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Also known as American. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. I well, think. Yeah. There is an American yeah. version of this that came out in 2009. I haven't seen it. I looked it up though, you and I recognize some of the names. It. That the uninvited. I think yes. is what it's called. Yeah. Yeah. It's. I have seen parts of it and it is horrible yeah it's like a very classic american remake where they just take the major plot points and they don't add anything and there's no depth and it doesn't mean anything and there's no fucking mise on set <laughs> it's just yeah. ariel cavill or whatever and her sister i will say that i loved the, the cabinet i'm so tired of a cabinet and like something evil presence living behind the cabinet or in a secret hole behind the cabinet so here I'm like, oh, here, but I had to remember it was 2003. And I've had a lot of movies in my brain since 2003 and a lot more cabinetry things have happened. So I'm like, okay, this is 2003. So I give, it's, it's okay. But the cabinet, like. 
Yeah. Don't lock me in the cabinet. Not yeah. the cabinet. Take the cabinet out of the room, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That must be really nice. Yeah. Also, wouldn't it have really broken? Expensive. It freaking really it totally fell over. Yeah. It fell over with like your dead wife and child. It smothered your other child. Like, wouldn't it have broken? Or is that alive? What, I would like to know. I keep turning to Allison. Allison, tell us the secret thing of why that happened. You made um, this movie after all. What did the director say when you called him and asked him? Right. <laughs> so I, one of my notes I have, the end, that sweeping <clears throat> pan of the faces after the cabinet falls over. When the cabinet eventually falls, there's this beautiful like series of everybody's face in the same direction. It's like It looks like it's a beautiful pan, but it's everybody, mm-hmm. just this quiet moment after you know what's loved that so yeah. much. I did Quite too. Uh, my th- the thing about that though, and this happens a couple of times in the movie, and one of my notes is that this house must be very well insulated. How the <laughs> fuck did they not hear that and go, I better go investigate that? And there were a couple of other points in the movie where like a big noise happens elsewhere in the house and nobody goes to investigate it. <laughs> didn't one of the, didn't the, the daughter, or didn't Sumi say something like, I'm sorry, I didn't hear, didn't she say that to her sister at some point? Yeah, like, I'm sorry does. I didn't hear you. Yes. Yeah. Like she has this guilt, for her it's this huge right. guilt because she didn't hear it fall. She didn't hear the mom, she didn't hear the, her sister screaming underneath right. the cabinet as she was suffocating. But there was a point where she says, I'm sorry I didn't hear you. Yeah. yeah. Or something like that. I do think that they all did hear the wardrobe falling over because I think they all look to the side and that's why their heads are all positioned looking mm-hmm. over the right shoulder. One thing that the director says in the commentary is, um, I'll just read you the quote, these three tracking shots show where these people were, what they were doing at the moment of the accident. They didn't do anything to help. They are all accomplices of this atrocity, and mm. the tracking shots emphasize that. They were all there. They all could have helped. Um, and in one way or another, did not. I think it also is like pretty in line with each of their characters. Like the dad is sort of this ambiguous force the whole time he's there, but he's not really doing anything or really participating. He's just sort of blank. I refer Um, to it as doddering. (laughs) He's just kind of doddering around. (laughs) But then later when I find out why he's so sad, I was like, oh, okay. I'd be doddering around too if if a wardrobe killed half my family. <laughs> and if your daughter is acting out the role of three different people, yeah. I think that's also why um, the dad doesn't uh, react to some louder sounds because she's always doing weird shit. Yeah. Well, there's a scene I think towards the end where um, she's on the couch and she is two different characters. She is the the stepmom, and then she becomes herself. Um, but then the dad walks in and he's just like, I'm so tired of this. Just stop. Just stop. I'm so tired. And then he like just walks out of the room and she's just clearly distressed. Mm-hmm. So yeah. the dad was, yeah, I like your, your terminology for the dad because yeah. he was just at a loss. He was at a loss because, again, he was experiencing his own grief and trying to manage the daughter <clears throat> with his own grief and her grief and everything. And it was. Right. Also, yeah. in a lot of ways, it's like this entire movie is the dad's fault. He brought Unju into the house. He was like a pretty shitty dad. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of it comes down. She even has that line, um, "Don't touch me with your filthy hands," which again, hands, right. hands are everywhere right. in this movie. But um, yeah, I, I, I did think talking about um, the pan shot of everybody's reactions after the cabinet falls over and whether people heard it or not. There is that moment, and she's the one who inevitably goes up there. And to react to what is happening, she, if the other daughter wouldn't have been there, maybe she would have actually walked in and been able to see what was happening. But she has that confrontation. The other daughter walks out of her bedroom and they have this like little banter. And it's a very important. It's like the most important conversation to me in the movie where they're arguing. And then the stepmother says, you might regret this moment. And then Sumi says, what can be worse than standing here with you? Right. Not knowing that her mom just died right. and her sister is being suffocated the very second it's so thick and yep. there's so much in the air and we know what's going on but just watching that dialogue between the two of them and just knowing the pain that's about to hit her mm-hmm. as she slowly like walks downstairs and out the front door not knowing then you hear all the screams in the, it's that's the end of it the last 20 minutes is just it's great the beginning of the movie i struggle with but yeah the last like i mean things break you find out one hour 13 minutes in that the sister is not actually alive Mm-hmm. So that's a long time in a two-hour movie, or barely two hours, hour and 13 minutes in. Yeah. But the, the last end, once you, like everything sort of unfolds after the big dinner scene, that's when I first started thinking like, okay, someone's not alive. Um, yep. 
I think I called it a gone girl moment in, the, <laughs> in my notes because I was just, I said like, whoa, Su Yun's dead. Whoa. And then, <laughs> like, like, cause I, uh, the whole time I was like, this person's definitely dead. But then I, and at no point was I right. And then, yeah, that was a huge <laughs> twist of a moment. Cause I, cause I was like, I was in the movie for that first hour, but I was, but I was still, it hadn't quite grabbed me, but then that was like a little bit of a twist. Mm -hmm. Not a little bit. That was a huge fucking <laughs> twist that immediately got me paying attention. And then I, w my mind was racing even more to try to figure out what was happening. And at no point did I know that she was representing three people. Mm -hmm. Right. I, uh -huh. at no point did I know that yeah, until and, the very end. And I had for like the first hour, I like, I texted Christopher, I was like, Christopher, I've th 39 minutes in and I paused it five times to do something else. And he's like, just keep watching. Something happens. <laughs> Snooze. Yeah. And then, but after the, the dinner scene, like that's when there was a, sh there was a quick flash of a girl in a green dress at the table who wasn't there. And I was like, okay, yeah. something's underneath the cabinet. And I didn't understand the barrette and then the girl in the green dress. And I knew that, and that's what woke me up a little bit. Cause I was, and again, I'm not like f super familiar with like, Korean horror films and I didn't know maybe this movie is just going to be like mm -hmm. a super quiet floating like intense no jump scares ever but that's the darkness maybe it is maybe this version of horror is the darkness and the depression of the mental health and even if there are ghosts I didn't think there would be like a wham bam boom boom woo the past I, 20 minutes which is where I was so after the dinner scene I was like okay I'll sit up a little bit I'm gonna look at every color <laughs> of everything in the room yep. um because yeah, the, every little piece. That's why I want to go back and rewatch it because I'm going to find more details that I that I want. You know, it's definitely a movie to watch more than one time. So if you're watching it for the first time, keep your rental, watch it one more time before you return that. Yeah, it's like I I wrote down that it has like a it it almost like when I watched The Prestige the first time, when I watched Tenet the first time, when I like it's like oh, there's a whole bunch of shit that happened mm -hmm. that I probably missed. Like there was there was one point where. Um, when I started to notice, like, oh, there's a bunch of weird shit happening, and this was when the wounds had transferred between two people, <laughs> and I went, that doesn't make any sense. And at first, I was like, that's a continuity error. <laughs> <And then, laughs> but then, but then, you know, <laughs> oh, because yeah, I man. thought I was really clever. Yeah, wait, yeah, you are. <laughs> Who's getting their period? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, that was. I did like that scene again with the yeah. legs. Legs are legs and feet, and that got colors. more than the hands. Oh, the colors, the reds yeah. and the greens. They yes. all mean something. Talk yep. about the colors. Tell me all about the colors. There are a lot of colors, and I liked all of them. <laughs> that which is a very vague thing to say, but it's true. Like at every every scene, my eyes were drawn to what was happening behind people, because there were always these. Sometimes there were these really loud patterns happening behind them. And I was staring at that thinking that it was, well, that might mean something. But mm -hmm. I was missing interesting things that the people were doing in the moment. Um, no, the, one, the, I think the thing I liked the most about this movie was the cinematography, the set dressing. Yes. There were some really, really cool um, camera things that they did, too. Um, which we can get into when we actually get to those points in the in the movie. But there were just, I don't know. Uh, it, it's a beautiful movie, it, it, as confusing as it was to me. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you guys didn't think it was a big piece of shit. Oh, <laughs> no. God, Cut this no. out of the podcast. But I was a little <laughs> afraid. Like <clears throat> Part of the reason why I prepared so much was I was like, they're not going to know what the fuck happened. Uh, Amanda told me last week, yo, I'm not going to like this. <laughs> I was expecting to hate it. And after the first 40 minutes, I was like, oh, crap. Oh, crap. But it was too beautiful to be. I knew it wasn't going to be crap the whole time. It was yeah. too beautiful to be crap. And as a person, again, like Matt was saying, like just the cinematography and the camera choices and the color choices, I was lapping it up with a spoon yep. while also trying to read the, right. the captions. Yeah, I mean, it's such a meaty movie to discuss and look at and think about, you know, so much going on. It's a great pick. Yay, thank you. One thing I wanted to mention is the cover. It shows the two girls sitting on this like antique couch. The parents are behind them. The dad is like just sort of there. <laughs> The mom has a really tight grip on so Sumi's shoulders. The stepmom? The stepmom, yes, thank you. The I was confused about that in the movie. Not to derail your point here, but in okay. my notes early on when I was like, mom seems cool. Um, 
I and then I have another note that's like I had no idea that this was the stepmom. Uh, that was not crystal clear to me. I think there's only one line when okay. the girls are in bed together. Okay. There's they call her stepmom, and then later I think they also um, have Unju saying something along the lines of "I'm the only mom you've got." Right. Yeah. It's just so I think that was that rude. was what made me put it together because then I later have a note that said, "Did bio mom die?" No, no, yes. <laughs> so. Well, yeah. that was, I was, I didn't know what happened to the mom, but I, th- I caught on early on that that was a stepmom, that mm-hmm. the dad brought her in, and that the girls, plural, the girls did not approve of her. Didn't at some point the older daughter, Sue Me, say something like, you brought her here, or this is your fault or something? Yes. I don't know what point they came in. Right. But visually, I was confused with the parents, with some of the... Because, again, once you realize that multiple characters were real or not real or playing each other, I was like, well, who, which one is that supposed to be right now? Mm-hmm. But I, I agree that having this house where there are people in it, but you're always alone in the house, it's almost like you cannot find someone in the house. You're there. It almost feels like you're in another dimension when you're in a certain room, yes. you know? And it's like... Where is everyone? It's it's almost like, you know, uh, I mix these movies up in the books. Haunting of Hill House, the, the original. Yes. Of, right? The haunting? You know, the haunting? The, it's the haunting. Yeah. It's, it's like this impressionistic, surreal kind of house that you're in. And that's a little bit how I felt about this movie, you know. It's like, where is everyone, you know? You can't mm-hmm. find everybody. They're right. all in different rooms. And a lot of times or, or, that comes into play and it becomes part of the story. Right, right. And yeah. it's a really small movie because it almost exclusively takes place in that house. And right. part of me wondered if that was like a, a limitation in production. And I think part of that is I'm just used to a movie like this being like, well, now we're at a hospital. Well, now we're here. But instead we're in this house the entire time, which was awesome because there's so much visually interesting stuff in every single room. That's an interesting point that you make about wondering where people are. It's like it, you're watching these people walk through these empty rooms and these long empty hallways and it's a very small feeling movie which I think really lends to the kind of generally spooky atmosphere of it. Mm-hmm. Not scary but spooky. Yeah, yeah, I think it did the visuals or the tone and the quietness. It reminded me of something like The, the Shining, the film. Mm-hmm. Like the sweeping corridors and the emptiness and like the pattern wallpaper and the two girls, like all of that just reminded me of The Shining in a very good way. Yeah. Because it, it had that spooky, quiet, creepy, like, ah, <laughs> element. <laughs> yeah. I've seen this movie many times. And Have you? the layout of the house doesn't make sense to me. And I wonder <laughs> almost if it's not supposed to make sense. It feels like a labyrinth, especially in the later, like the last half of the movie. You know, I've seen this hallway before, but that's not where I remember it being. I think it adds to that sort of um, confused feeling. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think the other thing is this movie is really from Sumi's point of view, which I didn't realize until um, I watched it for this. But it's entirely from her point of view. And I think that's why the sets are so small and sort of insular. Mm. Um because Sumi is trapped in this house. The only time she ever leaves is when she goes to the hospital and we only see her room. We only see, you know, her talking to the doctor in one small room. Other than that, she's trapped in this house. Mm -hmm. Um, And I also feel like I'm trapped in this hell house with her. Like there's no escape. We never leave. We're sort of following her around like shadows. And that could be too why we don't see what the dad is dattering about. You know, like (laughs) he's in the bathroom with a medicine cabinet. But for me, that just like... um, like flash forwarded to like the significance of the pills and who's taking the pills, figure out who's taking the pills. Um, it's her, it's not the stepmom. So, right. But that could be, if it's more towards her point of view, we're getting small glimpses. Like he, he leaves the home at some point. We don't see where he goes or anything. Well, in addition to hands being a huge thing in this movie, um, there are three main colors that are really important to this movie. Red, green, and blue. This is all my own personal theory, so this might be all wrong, but this is what I'm getting from my multiple viewings of this. Red relates to Sumi and is often an indicator of her inhabiting the role of someone else. Hmm. So in the first scene, when they get out of the car, Sumi is wearing a red sweater. We also see that highlighted in the very last scene 
of the movie. When the girls get out of the car, Suyan is wearing a brown shirt, which has red undertones, and a red skirt. So Sumi and Suyan are both wearing red. They are both Sumi. We also see this, um, like the next day, Suyan is also wearing a red skirt. At one point, Sumi is wearing something else. She goes and get those, gets those photographs. She comes home. She changes into a red shirt. Um, Suyan wears a white shirt that is a floral pattern, and the flowers are red. Unju in the dinner scene is wearing a pink shirt and a red skirt. So the color red is almost always about Sumi, and it's helping us identify when Sumi is another person. Mm -hmm. Green is often related to Suyan mm -hmm. and death. So she's wearing a green dress the day that she dies. Mm -hmm. When she dies, a picture of her, a baby picture, um, shows her in a green hanbok. Um, and that's actually an allusion to the original folktale, that green dress that she's wearing. Um, the kitchen sink that she's under is green. The wardrobe in her room, which is how she dies, is green. So oftentimes green relates to Suyan. Um, Unju is in blue. She wears a blue robe. She's in front of a blue television. And almost always when they show blue, they immediately flip back to Suyan. Or I'm sorry, they immediately flip back to Sumi. And there's almost always red right before or right after she's wearing blue. I just remembered the blue television, of course. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I mentally just glossed over that. But <laughs> right. The flashback is yellow because it's happy. Okay. And the dad is almost always wearing gray because he's sort of a neutral figure. Yeah, I picked up on the visuals. Like, I didn't really pay attention to the blue, but the greens stood out to me as significant and the reds. I didn't equate, like, the green with the death, but I... I really like, oh, she's wearing green again, and she was wearing green when she was in the kitchen. When she, by then, I knew she because I knew she was the other character. Like early on, I wasn't figuring that out because I didn't know at that point like who was dead or who that she was all the characters. Right. That Sumi was three people. Yeah, I don't think I. <laughs> I don't know if I should even admit that it's like none of that color stuff would have made sense to me <laughs> in the moment, but because I, I just was watching, you know, I was focusing on the interactions between the people so much mm -hmm. because I was just like, well, that person's definitely alive. And you know, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, like I'm, I'm the, I represent the, the <clears throat> stupider audience that is going to be watching this. Movie. Well, I didn't, I didn't catch on to any, it took me forever to figure out the sixth sense portion of this. It took me forever. Right. So I don't think it's dumb at all to right. not understand it for, but for me as, as a visual person, like I just noticed the colors because the color, usually if there's a movie and there's a significant color and many filmmakers work in that mm -hmm. form where there's a significant color, even like the movie home alone, it's all red and green. Everything in the movie was purposely, it's red and green. Everything's Christmas. red, everything's red <laughs> and green. I go watch yeah. the, the movies that made us and I'm like, yeah. everything is really, you know, it's less significant than like death and whatever ghosts, but still it's like visually filmmakers have a thing or like the red mm. balloon or the, there's always a red coat. How many movies is there like a person in a red coat? Those are always significant. Even right. if the viewer is not quote unquote smart enough to figure out why you can like, okay, red coat or, Oh, that. So yeah, it makes yeah. sense. So Allison, I appreciate your, your in, insight on yeah. you might think, that. but the blue, I'm glad to hear about the blue. Cause I didn't think about the blue. I noticed there were a bunch of instances where I said, don't you get it yet? And I felt like they were toying with me. <laughs> like, 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 no, the answer is no, <laughs> I don't get it yet. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that really fucked me up on one of my rewatches was, um, the lighting is really specific if it's dark or light, and also the color tone of the lighting. So, for example, the first time where we see the whole family at the dinner table, the scene is lit in red, which I think relates to, like, Sumi is inhabiting the role of all three in that, because it's really just her and her dad at the table, but we see all four characters at the table. The scene is lit in red. Later on, we see the same dining room at the end, when Unju, the real Unju is sitting there right before she sees the ghost of Suyan, it almost doesn't look red at all because it's lit in green because we're about to see Suyan's ghost. So just the lighting itself can really change the appearance of the same set even. Well, now I really do want to go back and see the movie again. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, even just 
I was quickly pulling up some stills of the movie, and oh, here's one that's yellow. Here's one that's red. Here's one that's green. So the stepmother Unju in this movie is so good. She's yeah. fantastic. I just, I just loved how cruel and cold she was. Uh, it was great. Yeah, she really does it all. Like, there's the scenes where she's like manic, excited, right. like talking a lot, yes. and there's scenes where she's like a cruel bitch. Yes, there's scenes where she's scared. Like, she really, yeah, she does it all. Scenes where she's confused. Yeah. But in thinking about it, she was never her. That was that was Sumi the whole time. Yeah. So that was her interpretation of her evil bitch of a stepmother who was being manic or being whatever. That's messing me up a lot. You know thinking what I mean? about that. So yeah. It, she we, the whole time when she was doing all those interactions with her yeah. her two stepdaughters, that's her that's the the older that's Sumi's interpretation of her exactly. mother cuz mm-hmm. she's being her. Yeah, cuz when we see her much later like towards the end, it's just as like a different person. Mm-hmm. Right. And it and that that's messing me up right now. Right. <laughs> yeah, because really, yeah, that, that was that was her as a real person. That was the real yeah, her, where she's yeah. in the blue suit. Right. Um. There's also significance of like her squeezing the hand, her the stepmother's hand in that the room. Yeah. More hand shit. Yeah. 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 Hands, Hands are everywhere. Yeah. I love this shot when Unju is introduced. She comes down this long hallway, and it's like lit every other so Mm -hmm. she's in the dark she's in the light she's in the dark she's in the light and it makes this really creepy vibe when she's introduced you're Mm -hmm. immediately told like oh not so good (laughs) which is why my note was mom seems cool (laughs) (laughs) there's like a couple subtle hints in the interaction with uh when the stepmom is introduced with the girls they're holding hands and at one point, I think the stepmom reaches out and Sumi pulls Suyan's hand behind her. She also grabs her hand and I thought you guys held hands for a second. <laughs> and you like both moved. It's, just, it's for the viewing audience. <laughs> They're holding hands right now. For the listeners, we're all holding hands. <laughs> Matt got scared. <laughs> Pass the rubber gloves. All right. All right. <laughs> Also, the two girls go upstairs together, but in the next scene, it's just Sumi entering her room, and she finds all that weird shit. She puts her journal away. It's already there. She opens her wardrobe. There's already duplicates. Yeah, the clothes in the wardrobe, the two sets of a million of the dresses, and then, because then the at some point, the Sumi is arguing with her father about why are we here and why do we still, why are the clothes, why are you acting like everything's the same? Like That was a mo- that was a rare moment when I was watching this where I was just like, oh, I'm not supposed to understand this yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's showing that she's already done this. The mm. journal's already there because she already put it away. Same with, you know, the clock is a little clue. I think the clothes already being there is a clue, but then also... We see that scene with Sumi. The next scene is Unju going downstairs. We never watched her go up because it's actually Sumi going downstairs after going to her room. Mm-hmm. And then the stepmom also goes, and there's something about the dad's underwear. Like she oh, goes yeah. to put one down, there's already one oh, there. Right. And it's because she's really Sumi and she's having the same experience she just did upstairs. She already did it. Where she already did it. I was confused about why the, hmm. she grabbed the underwear from one room and then she went to put them in the room and then they were already there in front of the other room. This is very early before we know what the, the characters really are. And then she says something like, did you take your father's underwear? Well, you shouldn't. That's unmentionable. It's my job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which also, once you understand what that all is, if you look at it from the dance perspective, his daughter is arguing with herself two different roles, and that's why he's so stoic in that scene. He's just like takes a sip and he's like, this was delicious. I have things to attend to. It's because his daughter's arguing both sides of an argument. Right. Yeah. Well, too, if you think about it, and I didn't think about it till now, but it's kind <clears throat> of, she's the daughter living with her father and her mother is dead and the stepmother is, but if you think about the role of the parent and if she's doing the laundry and touching her father's underwear. And that's like the mo- the stepmom's role and the mom's role. So it's sort of like that division of household chores between if like the person who did it is no longer there, even though it's, I guess it's the stepmom's, <laughs> the, quote, the stepmom's <laughs> job now, even though he should do his own laundry. Yes. I would like to see this movie from the dad's point of view. I think it would be really sad. But she was so vapid and goofy during the dinner party. Yeah. <laughs> 
and to think about. I got so mad at that scene. I was just like, "What the hell is going on? Why is she acting so crazy?" And they don't. Yeah. Who are these people at the dinner party? And right. why don't they remember the story? Yeah. Because it was never a real story. Right. <laughs> I I think I the only note I had at that point was this is a bad dinner party. <laughs> <laughs> Read the room. <laughs> before, now I got to say before the <laughs> before that happens uh, there is a there is a shot when the dinner guests are arriving a dolly and a crane shot that happens that was so fucking cool. I think that's all I said about it. But um I think you probably know the one I'm talking about. It's when the guests arrive. Where it is showing her, like, being aware that they're arriving, and it shows you downstairs and then upstairs, and it's just this one long continuous thing that goes between rooms, and I can't even imagine how much of a pain in the ass it was for them to pull that off. Um, I just, that was the kind of stuff I was marveling at. But yes, the dinner party was, it was a bad one. (laughs) <laughs> Nothing good happened at well, that I was just really, party. <laughs> that's when I started just to get confused about what was going on. Because we didn't, I mean, that is the scene that you start to figure out that something's not real. Something right. with the girl under the sink. Like something wrong with, something's wrong with this house. There's a girl under the sink. And I still don't, I didn't, I was, I was like, who are these people? Why are they there? Why is this woman like manically telling this like story that's so funny to her? No one knows what she's talking about. Who are those people? Then mm-hmm. the woman starts just like, she's not choking to death she's has air coming out of her lungs the whole time so she's not choking but she's supposed to be choking she almost dies she's like like cataclysmically like shaking on the floor and she goes and she leaves what was wrong with her like that flailing the, yeah was like so amazing yeah she was like not breathing and then all of a sudden they were just getting in the car and leaving and i still i was just like she's not really choking you never find out why that was my note on the dinner. you never find out yeah why. it's like was yeah See, at that point, you know, I hadn't really pieced things together very well. And I thought, okay, the stepmother has just cast a spell on this <laughs> other dinner poisoned. guest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought she was poisoned. So, like, in a, yeah, I said, are they patients? Because I, because he was, a, it was like there was some angle that was leading me to believe that the dad was just like this doctor that was administering me pills. Too. I thought... Oh. Oh, is wow. this, are they patients? Is this like an experiment? Like, why Why are they so apprehensive to go to this thing? Like, we have to go to this dinner. And they're already having a bad time when they walk in the door. Yeah. So I then I thought, yeah, maybe she got poisoned or something by mm-hmm. them. Um, and now it's like, was was the ghost that's, that is in the house that we don't see until later, was it, it has something to do with that? Like, why did she barf? And then rub her head in it, which was super gross. Yeah, but, um. yeah, very gross. <laughs> Didn't it say though? Wasn't it like the somebody's sister or brother? Wasn't it the aunt and uncle? Yeah, is that who they were? They said it was the aunt and uncle. It's the stepmother's brother and wife. Uh, so they were dreading going to see. It was a dreading. They're in the car driving there. They're dreading going to a family function. Right. So I picked up on all of that. Right. But it never. I didn't know why they didn't, didn't remember the stories she was telling and why she was so sure and excited about the stories. And then the whole thing with the choking and the puking and the gagging, and then they leave and it's just like nothing ever happened. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, wait a minute. That woman almost died right there. But yeah, I have a theory about it. Enlighten us. Um, so initially when I watched this, I thought that it was a seizure, but then I tried to do just like some really quick Googling and um, there were a couple things about it that don't seem like a seizure to me. Like my limited understanding is people are generally unconscious when they have seizures. Like and there's silent. a lot of different mm-hmm. types of seizures, but yeah, um, like, yeah, making noise is not usually a thing. And she's full on screaming. You can, yeah, she has she, air in her lungs. She right. has air in her lungs. <laughs> so she's not choking. I think that the presence of the ghosts is somehow causing her to recreate the mother's death. Ooh. Oh. Yeah, because the mom had the same puke in her mouth in the cabinet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't think about the pills poisoning, but I wondered if the pills had something to do with it because when we eventually see the mom's body, the pills are in there. Mm-hmm. There's that scene towards the ends where the green bottle, again, green bottle. Green death, red. It, it, oh. the, it rolls that at, was the, at the end. Such a great um, shot, wasn't yeah. it? Or the dad's like, take your pills, you'll feel better. And so, and that was at the, after the dinner party, he slides her the pills. And so then maybe, I mean, what if the pills were out earlier and then the, the aunt? But if the ghost, so theoretically the dinner party was four people. 
it was only Sumi, the father. But if the mother-in-law was never there, or the, the stepmom was never there in real life, uh-huh. like those were those two people ever even in the house? Yes. No. They, were they real? And who was actually, who the, did they see at the dinner party? The dad and the one daughter? Yes. It was a f- dinner of four. The yeah. dinner is actually the dad, Sumi, who's acting as Unju, and then the real um, uncle and aunt. And one thing that I didn't notice until one of my rewatches for this is the aunt and uncle come over the day that Suyan dies. Oh. And so that is the last time they would have been in the house was the day that she right. died. I miss that. Yeah, and I was yeah. curious about when she opened up the cab- the little um, the chest at the end of her bed or wherever it was, and there was that little box she was going through and finding the photographs. And I was like, okay, these photographs, they all mean something. There's so many people. And that's when I began to try to wonder or put together that the stepmom was the nurse, but I didn't know the mom. I didn't know the mom had died. I didn't know the mom. I didn't know the mom. I didn't know what she looked like. I didn't know if she, would, if she died. And we'd seen there's pictures in the, but I wasn't again watching this one. I wasn't putting it all together. But when the photos came out, I was like, well, is the nurse? Is she the nurse for in the hospital? And did Sumi come out of the hospital at the beginning? But because I still wasn't sure if it was the beginning of the movie or the end of the movie that we saw at the very beginning. So I was wondering, like, whose nurse she was. I'm like, is that, that's the mom and that's the nurse. So the mom was alive and she knew the nurse. And I didn't really, you know, it took a minute to realize that, you know, the dirty hands and like, because she was the one who was sleeping with her father when her parents were together, still together and her mother was sick and dying. Mm. Also, the dad is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> He's just selfish. Just, just, just circle really back, selfish. circle back to, I feel bad for him in his grief and working with his, his one living relative who is his daughter who can't handle anything. I do feel bad for him, but also it was all your fault. Yeah. See, I didn't even pick up on that whole photograph scene at all because I'm still coming in with these like terrible preconceptions of typical horror movies. Yep. So the music's building and she's flipping through the photos, flip, flip, flip. And then she sees the woman in the white outfit who is the stepmother. And I thought, you know, again, my preconceived ideas of typical horror movies it's like somehow she's just appearing in these pictures uh-huh, uh-huh. yes <laughs> yep of course that has nothing to do with it yeah yeah, yeah. But it's hard when there's a movie that's quiet it gives you that extra time to like try to figure it and it's quiet you're lost anyway you want to at that point you're like okay i'm putting all the pieces together i'm gonna figure it all out. i'm gonna become the sleuth and figure it out <laughs> yep. um and then but that was one of the times that I started to do that. <laughs> it didn't all come to, I didn't, yeah. it was a slow build for me and for the movie. Yeah, I was a bad sleuth. <laughs> well, also, like, the movie is a puzzle, and you don't get the middle piece until the last scene. Yep. So it's literally impossible, I think, unless you're, like, some genius. But the other thing is, this movie is from Sumi's perspective, and it's progressed by memory so the more that she remembers about what happened the more information we're giving given as an audience and so you don't get the bulk of what's happening until way later yeah i feel a little bad because this movie is one that is like so good on a rewatch but Mm -hmm. sort of tough to be like hey watch this (laughs) four times (laughs) i will say so the movie came out in 2003 and i've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of, like, I've watched a lot of David, I love David Lynch. I've seen so many of his movies. They aren't supposed to make sense. And he doesn't want you to know exactly what he's thinking or what. So when I watched this movie, I just figured that was this kind of movie where we're not going to know. And I was wondering if I would have watched this when I was, like, 20 and hadn't seen so many other, well, I'd seen a good bunch of David Lynch before then. But if I had, had watched this kind of movie earlier in my, like, you know, deeper, darker, cinematic, you know, crazy movie watching time that began you know when i was around like 17 or so i wonder if i would have reacted to it differently because i had already by watching this now even though the movie came out in 2003 i had already seen a lot of movies that don't make sense and weren't supposed to make sense so for this movie i was like well maybe i'll know what's happening maybe i won't and so i was having this sort of like philosophical debate with myself while i was watching it and then afterwards i was like well we're discussing it tomorrow i'm just gonna do some googling and read some articles and some interviews just to have some 
information. But then I was like, wait a minute, but if this was something by David Lynch, there'd be all these, like, you know, Reddit posts and people talking about what they think it means, not what actually it means. And here you can find from the director's mouth. What, and it's great because not everybody rolls Lynch style where they don't tell you right. you're not supposed to know and I'm not going to answer that. That's fine. But I'm so... I. I've grown to love his perspective and to know that I'm not going to know 18 hours of the return. You're not supposed to know what happened and what it really means. That's just part of not knowing. But there were times when I would watch David Lynch movie and like my friends and I would just sit there for hours analyzing every freaking thing. That was before we could Google and get information. We had to figure it out for ourselves. So part of me last night didn't want to do that the Googling of the research. I just wanted to come in today and just like be four friends in the back of the seat on the way home from the video. Like, oh my God, what just happened? <laughs> like it was, you know, 1994 and we didn't have to, we couldn't Google anything, you know? Right, um, right. So <clears throat> watching it present day after watching so many other like cr films that didn't, and there's a lot of movies that, don't, that you, you don't understand every little piece, but I feel like now there's so many films that are so significant and Part of the discussing it and getting the meaning from the creators afterwards is part of the process. So last night while I was watching this and struggling before the dinner scene and then after the dinner scene and then at the end of the movie and last night at like 10.30, I was like, wait, what do I do now? But of course I looked up articles and found information because I thought it would be valuable just for me as like a viewer since I wasn't going to get a chance to watch the full thing again. Right. So that was a lot, but there you are. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have to understand if you're not even there's yeah. other movies other normal like not normal but <laughs> just as other typical there's a lot of movies that don't make sense or yep you know but part of it is just the the hole we all fall into of trying to figure out what did Lost Highway really mean <laughs> <laughs> and well, then you figure it out and you think you know it and you're like I got it yes and then 10 years later you're like wait a minute what did it mean again right <laughs> but it means something different because you're at a different point in your life well, in this, like what, like what Allison said, this movie distinctly felt like a puzzle box where mm -hmm. it was like, I'm supposed to figure this out. So I felt challenged by it. Yeah, I just, I just didn't get there. See, I think this movie works as a puzzle, whereas sometimes when I watch a movie and I try to puzzle it out and figure it out, it's like, oh, this movie was just badly made. <laughs> yeah. Right? And then... I get so used to not even trying to puzzle it out because you watch so many bad movies. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, there's, why are they wearing red? Because that's the only color in the wardrobe <laughs> that day. Yeah. You know? Exactly. And so you get so used to watching movies that without any thought behind them that when you come to something really good that has a lot to chew on, mm -hmm. you have to reorient your mind and your critical viewing and think, wait a minute, no, everything was intentional, so pay attention, dum-dum, you right. know. With that in mind, because, of course, I think a lot, of, I, a lot of that stuff was lost on me. Being able to watch it and pay more attention to lighting and specific tr color choices and things like that. Like, <laughs> what's funny is there, there, was, there was one color thing that got my <laughs> attention, and it was that the dad's Old Spice bottle was green. <laughs> I think about that Old Spice bottle all the time. And I went, and and, par and part of me was just like, Matt, you're thinking about this way too much. That's probably just how it is there. <laughs> like, because Old Spice is something that was, uh, you know, in our medicine cabinet, and it's a white bottle. So when I saw it, I paused the movie and I was like, that's definitely Old Spice. Why the fuck is it green? <laughs> but I don't think, I think, I don't think that has a I didn't a think about answer. the color. I just like, oh, it says it in English, Old Spice. Right. That was my, I'm like, oh, look, English words. Right. I didn't even, but the bottle was green. I didn't think about it. Was it was green. Isn't it red? It's yeah, it's like, I, I it's like white spice. Yeah. And it's, it's like white and red. Right. Yeah. Wait, and I old didn't spice? Even, yes. It's white and yeah. red? This yeah. morning. Is it, yeah. is it white with a red lid? It's a classic <laughs> scent. <laughs> I used to buy it from my dad for Christmas every year from Meyer. Yeah. Six dollars. Yeah. And I didn't even notice. Yeah. It's green. <laughs> oh, because it's death. It's death. Green means death because Allison told us. Well. <laughs> I, I. I think we just blew a hole in your theory there. <laughs> well, but this is what's fun about... Because sometimes you don't have to... But the thing is, so this movie, you should, in theory, be able to watch a high-quality Korean horror movie or any movie and just watch it one time, get your satisfaction, and move on with it. Not every movie needs to be watched again. If I struggle with this movie, I wasn't into it, and I slowly got into it because it was beautiful, and I realized I was supposed to put together some pieces, the puzzle pieces, and figure it out and think about it. I wasn't in the mood to do that last night, but I do want to watch it again just because I am a fan of like the film and I like finding those small pieces of things that become meaningful. But I do think there is significant value in 
If you've only seen this movie one time, great. Even if you liked it or hated it, I still think there's value in watching a movie. And I think you should movies should be made to watch only one time and get your jollies or get your fulfillment and your satisfaction from. Um, so if anybody's only seen it one time, that's great. But also, you should totally watch it again, like I plan to do. Yeah. Maybe oh, not, yeah. Maybe not six times. I'll just watch it one more time. It'll be a, it'll be a minute. I got to watch Trinity Passant next. And we got to watch The Host and read 700 books. I That's have so just good. opened up a a Pandora's box of different Old Spice bottles. bottles? I did the same thing. OldSpiceCollectibles.com. <laughs> this is not an official <laughs> plug for them or anything, but there are so many different types of Old Spice oh bottles. Oh, my God. Are shaped like green? ships, cannons. There is a green one. It's oh, shaped a like a one. ship. All right, my theory is back. <gasps> All right. No, you know what? It's not. The, the, the liquid is green. The bottle is clear. That's a That's a bottle. That's a picture I just pulled up, which I believe... Huh. This is going to drive me nuts. <laughs> um, anyway, that was, <laughs> that was one of my very good notes. We don't have any sponsors on the show, or no. maybe we do now. <laughs> Christopher, <laughs> you need any more old yeah. spice? Uh, <laughs> what do you think our budget is from them? Find your address on the internet. <laughs> don't drink it at home, kids. <laughs> I've got a couple of questions. Yeah. That... Knowing the entire plot of the movie, so there are a couple bits that still don't quite gel for me or make sense. One of them was the refrigerator and the meat in the refrigerator. And then another one was the, the very violent scenes of the body in the bag. I, mm -hmm. I wasn't able to put those together, kind of rethinking the entire plot line. So... The first scene is when, uh, when the older daughter, Sumi, uh, right. It's the older daughter. That goes downstairs. Yeah. That goes downstairs. Yes. She talks to her stepmom. She goes into the refrigerator. She opens it and there's a strange package that she's unwrapping. And it turns out to be this kind of bloody stringy meat that we just glimpse briefly. And then Later on in the movie, when things uh, come to a head, there is a body in a bag that she's beating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on those scenes and how they... Bad food storage. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I was, I was looking at it like, that looks disgusting. And then I... Did I? I saw, I saw fish heads in it when mm -hmm. it fell down on the it's ground. Oh, fish I didn't parts. see it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I looked. Yeah, um, but, but that was just when it fell down on the ground. And I couldn't tell if that was just, oh, they're just showing me something gross. Because it happens kind of early in the movie. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that was when I was still trying to figure out the identity of it. Like if it is a thoughtful movie or a or an American movie. <laughs> 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 um, so, yeah. I think, um, I think that whole scene is meant to show that there is something strange. Um so, you know, she finds those bloody things in the fridge. The other thing I'll say is I love the first thing she does. She opens the fridge. She takes out a water bottle and she chugs so much water. Almost and then she flips it. it up and there's nothing mm -hmm. gone. Like she didn't drink any. Right. Oh. There was a little bit gone. There was a little bit gone because I noticed. I'm like, oh, she's really going to be hydrated. And she doesn't have to go to the bathroom when she goes to bed. <laughs> and then when she turned the bottle the right way, there was only a little bit gone. And I was like, oh, she'll be fine. Yeah. yeah. This is how we... My, oh, my own watches movies now. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Yeah. I thought th I thought the exact same. Thing. I was just like I would have to pee. But it did. But the, the it did change. So I literally thought she would be okay. <laughs> I was just like she's she's going for the whole thing. I was, looking, I was looking out for her. I don't know. Yeah. They already had blood in the bed yeah. and like the nightgowns and who knows. Yeah. <laughs> I think in the, I think the director says that. He intended it that Unju put those bloody fish parts back in the fridge, whereas, like, ordinarily you throw them out because they're not the edible parts of the fish, I don't think. And then that's also when we see Unju in her blue robe sitting in front of the television static, and it sort of has, like, a blue tint to the whole room because of that. And she, like, turns her neck around and then turns it back. I think his intention was to show that there's something... Actually, right after that, the girls are in bed, and Sumi says, um, there's something strange about this woman, and there's something strange about this house. Right. Mm -hmm. I think it's just to show that, like, things are sort of odd. Yeah. Something strange in that house, a girl under the sink. 
Oh, here's one other thing. Yeah. Well, let's finish talking about Christopher with the porcelain because you mentioned the doll or the the bag. So the bag. There was never a human girl in there, dead or alive or a ghost. It was always the porcelain doll. There's the giant porcelain thing that that she eventually uses or that the, we think the stepmom is using to throw upon um, oh, Su right. Oh, my and, God. But then there's other shots later where we see the porcelain. There's a sweep around the house where we see the bag. And there's another, not that, not the um, ceramic art piece, but there's like an actual porcelain doll. And we see the doll's head hanging out of it. So it was always a ceramic, of uh, the porcelain doll inside of it. Jeez, right. Yes. And I think a lot of that scene is just to show, like, <clears throat> it's right after... Um, Suyan is revealed to be dead mm -hmm. and it's sort of like the wheels are like really off the thing now because the next scene you know the dad is going to go get somebody to help him take Sumi away and that's when she starts um like she's inhabiting Unju the violence really ramps up at that point and also the sort of like chaotic flipping back and forth like when Sumi is looking for something sharp to open the bag that she thinks contains Suyan. Oh, she can't find scissors or a knife anywhere. Because I'm sure the dad, the dad took them all away. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. she's sort of puttering right, around in the right. kitchen. She's like frantically <laughs> looking for stuff. And then she turns around and she sees these really quick flashes of her taking medication, of her doing things that she did previously as Unju. And then she sort of shakes her head and keeps, you know, inhabiting herself or whatever. Mm -hmm. right. But I think it's like everything's coming to a head and yeah. she can no longer really like keep imagining herself as other roles. That is wild. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so thinking about these other roles right at the beginning of the, well, near the beginning of the movie, when we, when we first meet the stepmother, Unjo, we don't, we see the dad and the stepmother in bed together. And then at one point the dad gets up and he kind of pulls his arm away so is he just comforting his daughter so that's really her it's really sumi right right yeah. right right i'm just thinking back on that scene yeah. now because also that was when like oh we both got our periods on the same day right yep i think the oh go ahead i think the first time you see the dad and Uju in the bed i think you're supposed to think that there's like tension and like maybe they're in like some weird sexless marriage mm -hmm. yep. where they're not connecting. But once you, it's like one of those things where once you know what's happening, it adds this extra layer of, oh no, that's his daughter in bed with him. He wants her to fall asleep. So he's like, you know, right. hugging her or whatever. But then as soon as he can, he's leaving because it's really inappropriate to be sleeping with your teenage daughter yeah. in the same yeah. bed. Well, and right. I didn't think about that. I didn't think about it till now that that was really his daughter in bed with her. But that early on in the film, I wouldn't, I didn't know that that was any sort of split personalities or that she was all of these characters at all but not thinking about it that total makes total sense but at the time for me it served its purpose just showing that they had sort of a, this tense like sexless marriage and mm -hmm. i think that served its purpose where she was the the stepmother who came into the scene the daughters don't the daughters plural don't like her i was picturing it as like a four fa four unit household uh -huh. and i was putting together the, um how the relationships were and for me that's what that that scene did it was like okay the, there's still some there's friction within their marriage and maybe that's because of the girl's reactions to her being in the home and replacing the mother and where i didn't know at the point the, that time the mother was dead like um, so much misdirect <laughs> yeah. yeah but it all it all makes sense though and if <clears throat> and you don't have to make the note of it happening right. you know like as it's happening because you still it doesn't have to make sense you watch the whole thing then after the dinner party and things start going down and you see it, it you know what i mean you you put the pieces together. Yeah. Even if you don't put them together, you still get this. You understand the sense of what's happening. Right. Of who you're. Oh, wait, she's dead. Oh, yeah, she's all those people. One thing that I think is really interesting about that dinner scene is um, the stepmom and the girls are in the same positions at the dinner table that they are in the flashback at the end. Um, there's a stepmom on one side, both girls, and they're in, you know, Suyan's on the left, Sumi's on the right. And it's like an echo of what happened. I think it's Sumi sort of reliving that scene. Um, and one thing that I noticed is Sumi, you know, gets up and she leaves. And Suyan is still sitting there. And Unju says, you're supposed to follow your sister. She's giving her a prompt like, this is the part, like, this is your cue or whatever. Mm-hmm. I didn't catch that in the first couple times. I thought that was really cool once I 
Oh, the earlier dinner scene. Yeah. But wasn't that, oh, that was a separate dinner scene. That was just, that was before the and uncle were there, right? Wasn't that a yeah, separate, that was just a regular one. family dinner. Yeah. Right. I remember that line distinctly sticking out and thinking, <clears> it's just like, oh, maybe she's just, it, maybe we're just supposed to think that she is the troubled one of the two sisters. Like, because ah. they make Sumi seem really stable, ironically, <laughs> compared to like, especially when they're sitting together. Because Suyun is kind of always like huddled and mm-hmm. kind of like definitely seems like something's up. And that's just building more on how she's has problems yeah. or something. That's at least, that was my read initially. I just thought it was more of like a parenting thing. Like, oh, your sister's being dramatic again. Go after her. <laughs> right. I'm not putting up with either of you right now. Go and help your sister. I feel like with sisters too, we especially, like I have a sister and like my sister has two, two girls. And I feel like the sisters just get lumped together sometimes. Mm-hmm. My mom's sisters, my dad's sisters, everyone has all these <laughs> sisters in my family. And I just feel like it's like the sisters just get lumped. So for me, if that was just a familial dinner and like one sister was doing something dramatic and it's like, we'll go after your sister. Mm-hmm. Like it was just like, you're supposed to, you're the sister, that's your role. And also I'm the mother, I need to clean up, now go. Well, it also could have been this thing of like, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty heavily implied that the stepmom is a bummer and that maybe this is like a dinner rule thing. <laughs> like, oh, well, okay. <laughs> one, of, one of them has been excused. You have to go too. Yeah. Well, she's also like, so Yon's not even eating. She's not right. real. She's not eating. She's just sitting there. I think what you said though, Matt, is pretty spot on because we see in that flashback at the end that Sumi leaves and the stepmom takes Suyan's spoon. And that's why she gets up to leave is because she's like staring at her like really intensely and then she takes her spoon and that's her cue to like get the fuck out of there. Mm-hmm. I want to investigate the genre of bummer stepmoms. Bummer stepmoms. <laughs> <laughs> but then how much of the, like how much of the tenuous relationship between stepmom and Suyun was imagined by to me, you know, like how much, like how terrible is she really versus what we see in that? Like, is that all just a projection of like, oh, she is terrible and she was doing bad things to my sister, even though that could have been like a thing that happened once. You know what I mean? Yeah, what, did, was that any of that even, did that even happen in real life? Exactly. Yeah. You know, if, she, she, if she's already breaking down and trying to cope with the death of her mother and her sister right. and hating her stepmother, maybe the woman is not, at the end, she's not terrible and the dad still calls her. Right. So it does, you know, put into question, like, and again, you're not misjudging, like, how old is, are, is, is Sumi or Sunyun in either of these? What are they, like, 12, 14, preteen? They're very young girls. And if you, at that age, you've got so much going on and, like, you just, you hate everybody and everything, any authoritative sort of whatever. And then if, like, your father has a new person in the house, you might, you might think in your head, like, I hate them because they are so awful. Mm-hmm. And then if you are having this breakdown of dealing with the death of your sister, and your mother, and if you're recreating these scenarios, maybe you put that psychosis on yourself to think she's physically abusing my sister and, yeah. you know, who gave you those marks? Like, who knows what funny that was? It could be real. Right. It could not be real. Everything that I read after was talking about, like, stepmom was mistress and, like, other woman. And, like, that was not obvious to me when I was watching that. It didn't seem like there was overlap between mom and stepmom. And actually, like, I didn't. I couldn't figure out why the mom would be at that party (laughs) because somebody framed it in a write-up as an engagement party for the two of them. I saw that too. So why the hell was the mom there if it's an engagement party? I don't know, but I think that there is maybe something lost in translation there because the only time we really get insight into that relationship is when she's flipping through the photos and there's no dialogue right yeah um you know she shows up as a nurse i also saw online some people think that the mom has mental illness and that's why she has an aid some people think that she is dying and every time i watched it i tried to pay really close attention to that and i cannot tell what yeah. is going on there but i do think that it's clear that the dad was engaging in a relationship with Unju before the mom had died, if she was going to die. And I think it is very fucked up that he brought her into his house when he's still... His wife isn't dead. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? She's Mm -hmm. still there. She's upstairs. It is directly what leads to all of the other horrible shit. I think it's just one more thing where it's like the dad mm-hmm. really yeah. sucks. This guy is or is selfish. there any sort of like cultural difference? Like I also thought once you started looking at the photographs, um, that's when I was trying to figure out, okay, the mom was dying. But if there's these green pills 
if she's like taking those pills when she's in the cabinet, maybe she like you don't just schizophrenia can be like hereditary. So if the mother is taking these green pills that the daughter is being fed, mm -hmm. that the mother is like, and again, they're the same person in the movie, right. but thinking about it, like if, if we flash back to the pills with the mom and she's in the same pills, right. maybe the mom was just sick and be seeking treatment in the hospital and the father was trying to, okay, this could also explain why the, the mom is there, the birth mom is there, and then also the stepmom is there because maybe she is caring for the mother who is ill because she's also schizophrenic. And the dad, that's just part of how their family, the new family structure is, is the mom is still here. That could also be one of the reasons the mother eventually kills herself is because she can't figure, you know what I mean? Right. Um, I'm liking that theory at the current time, thinking about it. And I just, I didn't think about it till right now, but I yeah. don't know. I kind of, I don't know, maybe. This was, this was some of the stuff that was, that confused me to the point that it made me like the movie a little bit less. You know, I feel silly asking that about like why was the mom there but i was genuinely confused by that mm -hmm. because we had only really seen her in photos and so much about her is murky but again it's being told from the perspective of a young woman with schizophrenia of a child a child yeah who has right. a, an evil stepmother right a bummer stepmom <laughs> <laughs> So how do you know that was an engagement party? This was something I read after the fact. I would not have gleaned that on my like on my own. So it's like the dad and the stepmother getting married? From what I read, that was supposed to be an engagement party for like for the two of them. Right. Yeah. And the mom is there. And the mom is there. Right. Hey, uh by the way, I'm getting married. I thought you might like to come. Do you want to meet her? <laughs> you already know her. Listen, <laughs> well, good news. <laughs> the mom still lives in yeah. the house because right. the mom is ill. Right. I think the mom is mental. This is, again, my two cents. I think the mom is mentally ill and she needs to be in the house. And this is her family structure. But the dad also wants a person to, you know, do other motherly duties and other like fatherly duties and husbandly duties and sleep with them and just do all the things that, you know, you would do with a wife who was not sick. That makes sense to me. That uh, that's, tracks. Wait, why I mentally think. ill? I'm just, if, if the, the mother is also, if the mother is schizophrenic too, or if oh, the mother has some yeah. sort of melt, you know what I mean? Right, yeah, okay. So she, she's physically well enough. Cause if she was physically sick, she could be in a hospital. Or also if she was mentally sick, she could be in a hospital. But which is maybe that's where she was earlier. If it's the same doctors, maybe the mother was in this. I don't know. See, I just think cancer. <laughs> Because I I thought that too, but talking about it now, like yeah. I thought she was just dying of cancer and she didn't want to put her family through whatever she was going to go through. So that's why she killed herself. But I like this whole other idea of coming up with while we were having this conversation. Oh. I just like the idea that that she's mentally ill and that could be. In, and in the thing that I had read, it was like she hung herself because she was so despondent about the engagement. Yes, I think that that's true. I think that also is why the uncle and aunt are there. Because mm. why else would they be invited to dinner if it wasn't? Yeah. Their family. Right. I think the other sort of wrinkle to this is we first see Unju as a nurse. Like she clearly was brought into mm -hmm. the house for that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also that picture of her and the dad and they're both in like doctor's robes. Right. Um, but it does kind of make me wonder when did that begin? Exactly. Yeah. It's all twisted. It's all, I mean, it's all, you know what though? We're not supposed to, it doesn't have to all make sense. And yeah. it's not going to, because honestly, if you watch this movie and talked about it in passing, we wouldn't be sitting here like, what is this? And what is that? <laughs> but now that we have, we have the time and the attention to put on it. It's like, well, tell us more, Allison. Right. <laughs> tell us more, Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah. What does it all mean? One thing I really want to make sure we don't miss are all the ghost scenes. There's three. In oh, mind. yes. Yeah. Yes. So speaking of that, at the dinner party, once the sister-in-law is back in the car safe, she says, I saw a girl under the sink. How would you ever know that was a girl? I, I, like, yeah. Like, wow. I also paused it and rewound. So, like, did I, I miss that? <laughs> I did too. There was nothing yeah. there. And there wasn't anything there. And then when they show you the little flash, which was spooky, I, I immediately, my note was, was she burned? Because it looked like, like she looked pretty fucked up to me. Yeah. It's like a Tales from the Crypt kind of. Yeah. Right. yeah. I was just thinking someone with no skin, maybe. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Something well, like too, that. and I think when she says there was a girl under the cabinet, that was also one of the very first signs during the dinner party where you're like, wait a minute. And then the girl in the green, the flashes of the green dress girl is sitting at the table. You know that there's a ghost and someone's dead. Like mm. Then you think, wait a minute. 
So I never, I didn't stop to think like, was the ghost real or not? I just thought, oh, maybe. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't immediately put together, oh, ghost. I was just like, oh, red herring. I had no, I like, yeah, I didn't immediately. And again, I wouldn't have saw that person sitting in the chair, which was slightly out of focus. So I was like, oh, that's supposed to be spooky. And it is. I don't know why. And Were you and, scared by it? I mean, not, not scared, but I was definitely like, oh, ooh, that's a thing. You know? <laughs> my heart jumped. It, was, it wasn't a jump scare, but it was an ooh moment of like, mm. There was a very, very good jump scare not long after that of, um, from under the sink. Like the, Even though I knew it was coming, like you could feel that one was coming. Like it was, it was good enough that it scared me and Hildy, my dog, who was sitting Aww. in my lap. <laughs> um, well, then there was like the earring or the barrette that was there afterwards. Yeah. And then later on, you see the girl with it. Like, ah. Yep. Yep. Well, I love the concept of, you know, putting the blanket over your head so you are protected. And then, oops, sorry. <laughs> Someone's pulling the blanket off the bed. <laughs> yeah, I do like, but there's so many shots in horror films where there's like a hand coming around. It never gets old. It just sets know, a great scene yep, and a great yep. tone. Even if there isn't really a jump scare, even if, in some movies, you know, the ghost is real or not, or whatever thing is reaching around the corner. It just was really nice. And it was a really good introduction to, you know, because it's such a small part of the of the, the body. Mm-hmm. Again, they all said it's a hand. Yeah, it's yep. a hand. A hands down. <laughs> <laughs> like the movie is really slow. And I think that really feeds into like the tension that you feel in moments like that, where the door is opening so slowly And the noise from the door, like the squeak of the door gets so loud, especially if you're listening to this movie in headphones, it's like overwhelming. And then the hand comes around so slowly. Ugh. You know, because there's such a slow buildup of tension, things like that are are just like break the balloon. They just burst it, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's like, oh my God, look at this ghost in here, (laughs) you know. But that happened fairly early on in the film. Right? And I didn't think about it so now, but like at the time, then you begin to think, oh, the ghost is real. And then once you get into so many other elements of this, whatever's going on in the, whatever literally is going on in this movie, you kind of, I kind of forgot about it until the dinner scene. And it's like, oh, there is a ghost. Because then you, I saw the green dress girl and then it switches to a different thing with the father and it's just him and her. But I, at the beginning, I was like, oh, I believe the girl and there was a ghost. I didn't think I didn't think it was her, her dead sister. Um, I thought her sister was alive. I didn't know it was going to be Sion, but I still like, oh, there's a ghost in the house. It's a haunted house movie. I think there are two ghosts. Because I think that the first ghost that Sumi sees is her mom. Yeah. I, I yeah. The first ghost, the hand around the corner? No. When Sumi... So one thing that I find very odd about the scene with Sumi, like Sumi's nightmare, is it takes place in the morning. And I feel like most ghostly scenes are almost always at night in the dark for obvious reasons. But Sumi has a nightmare after she sees the bloody fish and she goes back and she comforts Suyan. Um, they're both sleeping. She has a nightmare that night and she sees like, Suyan's hand hitting from underneath the wardrobe. She sees herself in the forest. She sees her mom. She reaches out for her mom and her right. arm is all bloody. Later it streams blood, another hand thing. Um, but she sees all these flashes that sort of like signify Suyan's death. And then she wakes up. And then it's that really great scene where it's almost like we're seeing through Sumi's eyes and she's looking to her left. The camera is panning to the left really slowly. And then that crawling ghost comes into the frame, mm-hmm. moving left to right. She's on the ground crawling. Mm-hmm. She stands up. Her neck is bent. And oh, she yeah. moves side yeah. to side. Does that, yeah. that yeah. thing that yeah. a lot of movies did in that time? Yeah, in 2000. Yeah. It's like this is 2003. Tilted head, faceless yeah. figure thing. Yeah. yeah. The, the bet neck lady. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you think that's a different ghost? I think it's the mom because of her neck, which would be how she died in the wardrobe. And mm. also the sound. Like it's very quiet except for this weird sort of electrical sound. Yep. And that same sound happens much later when she comes out of the wardrobe like yes. with all the like ectoplasm and all that stuff the yes. the gross ghost thing <laughs> yeah two ghosts yeah <laughs> <laughs> got more entities <laughs> boom i'm gonna have to think about this yeah. Yeah. i didn't think about i didn't think about yeah. 
the the nightmare. <laughs> I'm really sitting here quiet thinking about that scene with the the lady and yeah. Two layers of dream world. There's only one ghost, and the ghost is the mom. The person that she's talking to is just this her imaginary sister best friend that's dead because she's schizophrenic, and that's another person. I think that she sees her sister and she talks to her sister, but. The, the the dark, burnt, black entity with the bent neck that's crawling and underneath the sink in the hand, those are all of the mother because the mother mm. died in the home and the mother is not the one that's confronting her. The, the sister is the one that she wants to console and be with. And she she talks to her sister as a physical entity that's there. She's not imagining her mom is there. She's never her mom. It's always her stepmom and her sister. So she's re- so Sumi is retelling the story of her of her sister and her stepmom. I still think the mom is the one ghost. The girl that's under the kitchen sink is wearing a green dress. Dang it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing that fucked me up the most looking through all these commentary things is um, when Suyan is revealed to be dead, I always assumed that Suyan screaming is Sumi. I assumed that she was taking on that persona and acting out her reaction to it. But the director specifically says that this is Suyan as a ghost finding out that she is dead. Oh, wow. that's great. Which still doesn't quite make sense to me. Uh. I had a theory that when Suyan is wearing the white nightgown, I thought she was maybe a real ghost. That's something I'm still puzzled about. But, you know, it doesn't have to make sense. Because if you watch with any piece of art, if you watch it and interpret it a certain way, you're using your, your current, past, and future experiences to give meaning to what you're seeing in something, whereas the creator had a completely different, somebody paints a picture that's just a complete red square. You see all this meaning and this and this and that, and then the artist is like, I just painted a red square. Or like with this movie, you see something that you think, and 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 then the director says, well, actually, it's this. It doesn't matter who's right or who's wrong. It's you're making a piece of art. And maybe, and in this movie, the director did have a specific thing where he says, no, it's this. Other movies, it's just like, eh, it looks cool, or oh, it means something to me, but I'm not going to tell you. It's okay if, if the director says, well, actually, it's this when you thought it was something different because it's, you still brought that with you, you know? And obviously, you love this movie. So <laughs> I turned yeah. to Allison. You know what I mean? So it, it doesn't mean you're wrong for interpreting something differently. Like, I've changed my mind 17 times. But you know what? I can't wait to, like, leave this room and then not analyze this anymore because, <laughs> wow, my brain's going to explode. I do want to watch it again. I'm going to rewatch it again maybe in February. And yeah. then we'll talk about it yeah. again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) I have a couple of notes that I have from that general time of the movie. It's just like, the something that is in this house, is it mom? And then I said, mom is haunting this house. (laughs) And then I said, where are the sisters during the dinner and post-dinner stuff? In my mind, I was like, how the fuck could they sleep through this? Like when she was convulsing on the floor. Yeah. But... Yeah, and I was wondering. They like, didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I wrote, sleeping with a candle burning, tisk tisk. <laughs> Matt is very concerned about fire. I was paying guy. attention to the importance of, oh, and I also wrote, dad is probably a bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> probably. <laughs> and that's like moments before I found out that Su Yeon was dead. <laughs> it's like, oh, shit. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> One thing that's really cool in the mise-en-scene regarding Suyan is a lot of the time she's wearing something that makes her blend in completely with what's ever behind her. Mm-hmm. So she wears a white shirt that has like f- pink or red flowers on it. And in a couple shots, she's in one of the girls' rooms and the wallpaper matches almost exactly. It's mm-hmm. And it's crazy wallpaper. Mm-hmm. I, I remember noticing that and... But not immediately putting together what you just said, just being like, oh, that's a really interesting design choice. Yeah. Just because it was striking. It happens when the girls are looking through the photos. Um, She matches almost exactly. There's also curtains behind her, which are the same color scheme. But also when she is revealed to be dead, she's wearing a white nightgown, which matches the white wallpaper behind her. And there's even a shelf on the wall, which is dark, Mm -hmm. which matches her dark hair. There's so many instances where it almost looks like she's not there or she's not supposed to be there. Also, when Sumi sees her mom's ghost, right before the ghost shows up, she looks over to check. Like, she wakes up from the nightmare. She looks over at Suyan, and Suyan's wearing that white nightgown, which blends in perfectly with the white sheets in their bed. And then her head is in shadow so much so that it almost looks like it's not there. So there's so many little instances of Suyan not being there 
visually. That's great. Right. And it's awesome knowing, knowing too, you talk about like, oh, you're not supposed to know what it means. For this movie, the director is laying out all of these pieces for you. Like every little instance mm -hmm. is every color choice, every placement of things in the background are, what is it, mise-en-scene? Yeah, mise-en-scene. Mise on, like it's all intentional. It's all laid out. It's all intentional. Also, the dad never addresses Suyan or even looks at her. That's one thing. Nobody, nobody ever talks to her besides Sumi. No one's. Yeah. No one addresses Suyan. No one talks to Suyan directly. It's those two. Suyan's only there when Sumi is right there. And I just chalked that up to, oh, she's troubled. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, and she seemed troubled just because the way she was portrayed. She yeah, was like quiet exactly. and dark and didn't talk and. She just seemed like a. I just thought she was like the younger sister who was going through something that that was her way of reacting to. Like I thought she was be, being abused by the stepmother. Like you know what I mean? Right. Like now that it, I, at the time I thought that was real and that she was that the stepmother was a real character or she was right. being portrayed, but it wasn't. So I just thought she was just like the younger, like going through something. We also might have talked about this a little bit already, but that that essentially like fight sequence with the kettle that is running the entire time. <laughs> Oh yeah, um, the, really well done and really intense and um, and looks painful. Uh, but I did notice there's a beautiful view out of their kitchen when <laughs> when, <Yes. laughs> when they're like I, I that I hadn't noticed. Like I was watching this and I was like, wow, look at the view out that window. There's the mountains. mountains. Yeah. <laughs> I at that point I had guessed. I bet she killed her sister accidentally. Nope. Oh. Uh, oh, and that's also where I noticed that the wounds had moved. Between Sumi and stepmom. The stabbed hand. The hand, but then also there was a wound on, on her head. On the head. I didn't notice and that. And somewhere all. else. I noticed that and I went, Oh, that's weird. <laughs> 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 I was like, how did they get the exact same wound? <laughs> <laughs> but then at the very, very end, when we see whatever ghost it is, at the very end, one of the fifty five ghosts in this movie. <laughs> um at the end, it's such a great, like, cut ending of just, like, under the bed. You, you don't see anything. You don't hear anything. It's just like, yep. It's a great visual of what's under the bed. It's and a ghost, I, and someone's going to get murdered. I love that we don't see too much of the ghost, and we don't see what happens to the stepmom. Yes, it's I think perfect. it's worse. Yeah. It's perfect. But also, this takes into consideration, like, the timeline of the movie. You know what I mean? So if she's in the hospital with her stepmother, who is alive, trying to console her, and she doesn't want her there, and she's squeezing her hand, then she goes into the room and is talking to the person. But then you see this whole thing, and then, so is the stepmother already dead at the beginning when she's in the hospital? When is the stepmother dead? I think she just dies at the very end, because when she comes into the room... That's when Sumi. She goes home realized. from the hospital. She what? goes home from. She comes home from visiting her, her stepdaughter Sumi in the hospital. She goes home and then she gets crawled upstairs and looks under the bed and then she gets killed. I think that's so. okay. That's what. Yeah, I think. because I sense. think that's also her first time being back in the house because she's like specifically kept away. And yeah, she's wearing right. that right. same outfit. Right. Yeah, right. she goes back in. Blue or yeah. Mm -hmm. I did like how it ended. I did like the going back to the beginning and the car rolling up. And then I love that you have one foot coming out the door, two feet coming out the door, and you're like, she's going to be alone this time, and it's going to be great. And then she steps out of the car alone. I just loved that ending, knowing mm -hmm. that she was always just her. And you know that at that point, it's just, she was yeah. her sister was never there. But I love that visual of her just opening the door and coming out alone. Yep. And it's a beautiful scenery all around them, lush greens. She's got a red sweater on. I just thought that was really, really, really artfully and well done. It's yeah. a good visual, and it's a good like tone of, yes, yeah, she was always. And all of the lines are intentional, too. Like, you have the doctor's dialogue, who do you think you are? Oh. Two ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yep. This is a movie that needs to be picked apart. I, I like the movies that you can sit and not know what the hell's going on and be fine with it and be like, yep, we're not supposed to know. But for this one, with every little set piece and the sparseness of the the lines and the dialogue, it all is supposed to be a piece. It's all part of a larger piece of puzzle. And I think that is super impressive. And it doesn't bode well for the casual viewer. No. Yeah, you yeah. Know, that's the, like, I think, honestly, like, when I watch something like this, I tend to think like, okay, what would I, how would I score it? Or like, you know, or like, how would I sum up my feelings about it? And it's like, it kept me captivated the entire time. And I and I don't know that I would necessarily revisit it immediately, because for me it's like <laughs> I wrote this down and now I don't know if I agree with it based on the stuff that we were all talking about. It's like this is a movie where once you get it, 
when you get the story, it's mm-hmm. kind of like you will not get the same kind of payoff that you get. Like I, I felt stunned mm-hmm. by the end of this movie. I was like, whoa, that's awesome. But now that I know the thing, rewatching it, sure, I'll be able to go through and, and look for a lot of the stuff that you're talking about. But because I already have a pretty, because I already have a ninety-five percent of the story figured out, it might not have the same kind of payoff. Yeah, and that's the only thing that I could say works against this movie for me. Because otherwise, it's like the entire time I was in, I was paying attention. Even if it was a little bit slow, it's probably like a seven or a seven point five out of ten movie for me because of that, and only because of that. It's very well done. It's probably the highest brow thing that we will watch for this podcast. <laughs> We're really starting strong. Well, you may have set the bar a little too high. You know, by the time we get to Driller Killer or exactly. I Dismember Mama Chopping Mall, you know, right. so, <laughs> Matt, you know I'm picking an '80s piece of trash at some point. Absolutely, <laughs> I hope so. Chopping Mall. <laughs> If you like what you heard today and want to let us know, you can email us at whatscaresus at aadl.org. Thanks for joining us. This has been What Scares Us.